Welcome to our daily devotion. The Methodist Church of Barbados invites you to sing, pray, and worship with us as we declare God's glory and celebrate His mighty acts. Precious Holy God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we worship and adore you. We bless your holy name. Father God, you are mighty and matchless. You never failed us yet. There is none like you. We come in your presence, Father, acknowledging that we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. We ask you, dear God, to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you, Father God, for another opportunity to share in this fellowship at a time such as this. We thank you for the technical teams who make this possible because of the technical wisdom with which you have blessed them. We thank you, Father, for our bishop, ministers, pastors, laypersons, leaders, and all others who work tirelessly in keeping us connected to you and to each other. We pray for a fresh anointing over their lives in the name of Jesus. We pray that you will bless the one who will bring the message tonight and those who are taking part in the service. Also those who are listening. We pray for those who would like to listen but because of illness or other circumstances, they are unable. Father, touch them at their point of need in the name of Jesus. Father, we come against the spirits of discouragement, fear, uncertainty, hopelessness, and loneliness in the name of Jesus. We speak peace and love in every life in the name of Jesus. Help us, Father, to be rooted in you so that our faith will be strong. Help us to have that sustaining joy in you, Lord, so that our strength will rest in you. Father, uphold us in your righteous right hand in the name of Jesus. In spite of our circumstances due to the pandemic, 
Help us to trust you as we acknowledge and obey the protocols. Cover us with your precious blood of protection and let your Holy Spirit be our guide. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Romans 5 verse 1 to 5 Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The Word of the Lord.
Let us pray. We gather tonight, Lord God, to worship you and to hear a word from you. We pray that your word to us tonight may lift our spirits and encourage us to renew our commitment to serving you and our fellow man. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Reflect with me for a moment on these words from Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. We boast in our sufferings. We boast in our sufferings. One hymn writer describing the Christian experience was moved to write, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Another, also reflecting on the relationship between God and the Christian, penned these words, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And especially during the Christmas season, we take great pleasure in saying, joy to the world, the Lord is come. And yet, in the midst of this dreadful pandemic, accompanied as it is by unimaginable human suffering, can we Christians claim to be a genuinely joyful people? When we reflect on the misery all around us, does it bring joy to our spirits? Tonight, many of us may not feel at all joyful. Many of us may be wondering, is there any hope for mankind? Are we human beings doomed to a life of suffering? Where is God at work in our lives, in our world? What is there to be joyful about? Maybe the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, can provide us with answers to our heartfelt concerns. Paul makes a number of audacious claims in our text. Firstly, Paul claims that the past, the present, and the future of the human race were made secure by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Paul's first claim is that the work of Jesus on the cross gives us reason to boast, to be joyful. At verses 1 and 2, Paul assured the church at Rome and assures us that those who are justified by faith have peace with God now. That those who are justified by faith have access to God's grace now. And that those who are justified by faith have a future hope of experiencing God's glory. A future hope of living in God's presence. Paul says that those who are justified by faith have good reason to be joyful. And that's not all Paul claims. Paul goes on to make another claim. He argues that those who are justified by faith, even though they may be experiencing suffering now, Paul claims that the justified need not be fearful. For the justified are also experiencing God's lavish love, God's extravagant love, a love he poured out through the gift of his Holy Spirit. In this text, Paul is confident that our hope for the future, our peace in the present, our experience of God's lavish love in the present are dependent on only one thing, on what God has already done for us through Jesus Christ on the cross. And any present suffering, says Paul, does not, cannot change that in any way so we can rejoice. Now Paul had argued in the earlier chapter of Romans that God was seeking to restore the original relationship between mankind and God. And that's why God sent his son Christ Jesus into the world. Not to condemn the world, not to punish the world, not to make us suffer, but to save the world. Paul had introduced the word justified into his argument. He had claimed that we human beings are justified when we believe in the work of Christ Jesus on the cross. Paul was confident that for those who trust in what Jesus accomplished on the cross, that God declares such persons not guilty, that God declares such persons in a right relationship with him, 
that God declares such persons as justified, no matter what such persons may have done in the past. What Paul meant was that th for those who trust, for those who rely on Jesus, God removes every barrier between them and God. What Paul meant was that for those who trust in Jesus, we are free, we are forgiven, our sins are blotted out, cast into the ocean, our past no longer matter. What Paul meant was that such persons are reconciled to God. Such persons are no longer God's enemies. Or as Charles Wesley would write, no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Our past, our present, and our future are secure, says Paul, through faith in Jesus Christ. My friends, Paul is offering us many reasons for being joyful. He is claiming that for those who are justified, those who have faith in the work of Christ Jesus on the cross, those God declares to be not guilty, those God forgives, we Christians can have peace now. We can have access to God's grace now and we can rejoice no, for we have the hope of a future. Paul is claiming that we Christians are secure always in the past, in the present, and in the future. So we can be joyful. But Paul also knows about suffering and hardship. He knows it is the daily experience of human beings. He knows it because it has been his personal experience. But should suffering, should the hardships of life cause us to doubt, to lose faith in Jesus, to question our past, present, and future security? Not at all, says Paul. Paul sees merit in suffering. He believes that even when we are suffering, we must rejoice. Verses 3 and 4. We also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Paul claims that we are to rejoice in our suffering. We are to rejoice in the face of hardship. Paul does not claim that we are to rejoice because of hardship. No such thing. That would be the behavior of a deranged mind. No, what Paul is saying is that we are to rejoice even in the midst of suffering, that we are not to allow the suffering to squash our hope. And Paul tells us why. On the one hand, says Paul, suffering builds character. Listen to his words at verses three and four. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Helen Keller, who lost her sight and her hearing at 18 months of age, knew about suffering. And Keller, whose work as a social and political activist in the 20th century inspired many to overcome difficult circumstances, agreed with Paul. Keller once wrote, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through the experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Adversity and suffering shape our character. That's one reason why Paul says we can rejoice in the midst of suffering. But it's not the only reason we rejoice in the midst of suffering. Paul also tells the Romans and us that contrary to popular belief, suffering and hardship are not signs of God's lack of favor toward us. They're not signs that we are in God's bad book. They're not signs that God does not love us. 
Like many of us, Paul wrestled with this matter of suffering. In the same letter to the Romans at chapter 8 and verse 35, Paul asks rhetorically, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? In other words, does suffering mean that God does not love us? Paul's answer is a resounding no. At verse 37 of chapter 8, Paul literally screams his response to his own question. No, he says, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Far from not loving us, God lavishes his love on us through the gift of his Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit, God's promise to God's people, is the sign of God's love even in the midst of suffering. In Paul's own words at verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. In a world which appears to be in chaos, on the brink of collapse, Paul's words to us tonight are most reassuring. Paul is confident that we can experience peace now. That we can have access to God's grace now. And that we have an eternal hope of experiencing God's presence in the future. Furthermore, says Paul, we can rejoice in the midst of our present tribulation for our suffering is shaping our character. And in the midst of our suffering, God's Holy Spirit assures us of God's love for us. Paul's assurances, however, are conditional. Paul's assurances are on the basis that we trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. For then, says Paul, we are justified. And since our past, our present, and our future are secure, we can be joyful even in the midst of adversity. Let us pray. Our hearts are filled with joy, loving God, because of what you have accomplished on our behalf through the work of your Son on the cross. May we walk in the assurance of your love, trusting you for all that is to come. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Everybody.
fasting and his weaknesses suffered because of the gospel, even as he continued to preach the gospel, was a boast in what God had done for him in Christ. It was not a boast in himself. And his boast in his weaknesses is a boast in the gospel that brings the appropriate praise to God and not man. The sufficiency of Jesus' grace in his weaknesses made Paul strong in the Lord. Because God's grace created resurrecting power in Paul when he suffered. Just as God's grace created resurrecting power in Jesus' life when he suffered and God raised him from the dead. Brothers and sisters, we have encountered the living God through the love of the living Christ. We have been refreshed by living water. Go now to live in the hope this encounter inspires. Be water bearers to a dry and parched world, knowing that the God of love and hope goes before you and is with you always. Amen. Thank you for being a part of our daily devotion. We trust it has been a blessing to you. Now together, let us hold fast to his word and may it dwell in all of us richly.